Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you joining our meeting today, and I apologize for the uh, late start. We had a couple technical difficulties um, in the beginning, but I appreciate you joining the Ohio Legislative Children's Caucus for today's meeting. Um, if you'd like to know more about the caucus, please visit the website at ohiochildrenscaucus.org. If you have any questions and comments as for our panelists um, as we're going through the program, please post them in the chat and we will do our best to get to your questions um, during the Q&A portion of our program. The meeting is being recorded and it will be accessible at the children, the Ohio Legislative Children's Caucus YouTube channel. And I will put that chat, that link in the chat. Um, all, the, all the content recording links and everything that we share in the chat um, plus any other resources that are shared with us will be sent to you in an email following this presentation. I want to thank our, our uh, esteemed panel for this afternoon's co uh, conversation. We appreciate all of your time and your expertise. Today, we are going to hear from Javar Jackson Sr., Chief Operating Officer for the Third Street Family Health Service health services, Nancy Pepler, Supervisor of Community and School Partnerships, Cleveland Heights and University Heights City School District, Dina Thurman, Nurse Practitioner with Dayton Children's Hospital, Dr. Sherry Shamblin, Chief Strategy Officer for Hopewell Health Centers, and Dr. Mona Mansour, Professor of Pediatrics at UC College of Medicine, an Associate Director of Population Health in the Division of General and Community Pediatrics, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. We know that school-based health care plays a crucial role in promoting the well-being of students in Ohio by providing convenient and accessible health care services within the school environment. This eliminates many of the barriers to health care by offering services directly in schools, making it easier for students to receive the needed care. It helps address healthcare disparities impacting specific populations like low-income families, rural, rural communities, and students with disabilities. Access to healthcare services means students are less likely to miss school due to illness or injury, and this translates into improved academic performances and attendance. School-based health centers offer preventative care services like immunizations, health screenings, and dental care. And by addressing these health issues early and providing preventative care, um, school-based health centers can help reduce overall health care in the long run as well. We know that the Ohio legislature has recognized the importance of school-based health care and invested in expanding these programs and services, but there's always room for growth um, to ensure equitable access for all students. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Reem Alley, Executive Director of the Ohio School-Based Health Alliance and our panel of experts. Reem, it's all yours. Thank you, Kelly. And we are um, so um, happy to be here. And, and um, on behalf of, of this panel of school-based healthcare experts, I thank you for, for your time today. Uh, I am Reem Ali, and I am the executive director of the Ohio School-Based Health Alliance. We are the only nonpartisan statewide organization created to advance and support the sustainability and expansion of school-based health care to improve health and education outcomes and reduce disparities for Ohio students, their families, and communities. As you will hear from our wonderful panelists, today. Uh, there are a couple of different um, ways that schools and healthcare providers can partner together to provide school-based healthcare services. And school-based health centers are a critical evidence-driven strategy to closing healthcare gaps and helping students overcome obstacles to academic achievement. So I want to, I want to turn it over to our panelists and start off with uh, just a, a broader question, if they could please share their organization's role in partnering to provide school-based healthcare services and talk a little bit about what, what their partnership looks like. We can start with Dr. Shamblin. Well, good afternoon. 
Um, so I'm Sherry Shamblin. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Hopewell Health Center, and we're a qualified, federally qualified health center community mental health center serving 10 counties in southeastern Ohio. And all of our counties are sort of in that Appalachian region of Ohio. We have be and so we partner with school districts in a number of ways. Um, I, I call us a continuum, you know, like there's a continuum for school-based health care. We got something along that whole continuum. And as an early childhood clinician, as by background, I think about things as a developmental approach. And so we've learned things across time. But currently, we have behavior, behavioral health partnerships with 20 school districts where we have counselors and case managers seeing students on site. And then we operate five full care school-based health centers that provide primary care and behavioral health. And one of those provides dental care as well. Um, those are located, three of them are located in Athens County, Trimble Local, Federal Hawking, and Nelsonville, York. One is in Chillicothe um, at the Mount Logan School, and one is at Meg's in Eastern Local, and that is the one that provides dental care. Um, Trimble and Nelsonville only serve students and staff, and the remaining three also serve community residents in the area. And altogether, that represents about 3,200 students that got care last year and translates into about 44,000 visits. Thanks, Sherry. And um, just to, to provide a little bit more context, so for, for all of our panelists, we are talking about um, generally on site. Uh, services. So that means that the the clinic, um, akin to a primary care clinic, is located, co-located on site um, at the school. So the provider is located on site to provide those services at the school. Thanks for thanks for sharing. And can we move to Dr. Mansoor. Thanks, Reem. Um, yeah, we um, at Cincinnati Children's, we have school-based health centers that really provide uh, comprehensive health care similar to what you would see in a community pediatrician's office. Uh, we provide well-child care immunizations, developmental behavioral health screenings, preventive dental care like fluoride varnish. We provide care for chronic illnesses like asthma, ADHD, depression, headaches, as well as acute illness care for things like sore throats, ear infections, uh, concerns for flu-like illnesses. Um, our nurse practitioners that are the primary providers in these clinics are able to draw blood and be able to do testing on site to support more efficient care to get kids back in the classroom. We write prescriptions for any needed uh, services. We also have some interesting partnerships. We um, have a co-located co community health worker. We screen for social determinants of health in our clinics. And so we have uh, folks that can help us um, you know, connect families to resources who identify food insecurity or financial strain or housing challenges, transportation challenges. Um, we have really close re relationships with our co-located mental health partners, um, so we can make direct referrals to those co-located mental health partners, but we also can refer back to Cincinnati Children's for mental health services, as well as for some specialty services for children who have more complex chronic conditions that are uh, similar to a community pediatrician, um, but have some really nice facile ways to do that. Um, our providers also provide care through telehealth. Um, so um, we not only can see kids in the school, but if kids are too sick to come into the building and uh, want to prevent spread of illness, we can see them through um, telehealth visits. And then we have some really cool partnerships with um, a couple of our subspecialty areas where we um, also through telehealth um, provide care for kids with asthma um, with an on-site um, respiratory therapist teleprompter, but allows us to get access to specialty care without the child or family having to leave the school building. And a similar one with our developmental behavioral pediatrician um, to um, bring, um, you know, early identification of kids that might uh, benefit from um, more specific um, developmental services to keep them on a, a healthy trajectory. We currently have three locations. I mean, all in Cincinnati Public Schools in Hamilton County, two that are elementary, middle schools, one that's a high school, all have significant Medicaid populations. Um, but we do not only provide access to the students in the school, but they're really meant to serve the broader community. Um, they started out, you know, focusing on the school, but we actually have, um, in addition to the students, more community um, serving members because they really have thrived um, in the community. And then we are really looking, we just launched a coordinated school strategy at Children's. We're really looking at how we can more fully leverage our complement of services with additional school districts that are in our uh, primary service area in Southwest Ohio. Thanks, Dr. Mansoor. And I see on my screen, Dina, you are you are next on my screen. So if, if you want to share more about your school-based health center partnership. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I'm Dina Thurman. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner at Dayton Children's Hospital. 
And I work in our one and only school-based health center right now. Um, we are in our second year. Um, we are located in Xenia Community Schools, um, which is a suburb right outside Dayton. Um, and our school-based health center is located inside of the middle school. Um, the district serves around 4,000 students. So we can see any child in the district pre-K through their senior year. We do have the ability to provide transportation for kids ages eight and older to the school-based health center. So there are five elementary schools at a high school that we transport kids to the school-based health center for. And much like um, Dr. Mansour said, we provide a um, kind of a spectrum of care from acute illness to um, developmental behavioral screenings, um, chronic disease management, some um, mental health um, care, ADHD, depression, anxiety. Um, it's just myself and one other um, hospital employee right now. So we're a pretty small um, group um, providing the care. But like I said, we're in our second year. I think since we opened, we have seen over 1,200 um, children um, in our school-based health clinic. Thank you, Dina. A small but mighty team you have there. Move to Nancy, if you can you can share from the, the school perspective uh, what your partnership looks like. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm, again, Nancy Pepler from Cleveland Heights University Heights City Schools, which are an entering suburb of Cleveland, for those who don't know. We have an enrollment of about 5,000 students, and we began our relationship with Metro Health um, in 2018 for school-based health services started small, they used an existing classroom twice a month. We grew, we gave them their own space, and then we worked with Metro as they applied for the expansion dollars that were co-funded by from um, the Department of Education and the Department of Health. And we built out and opened two years ago, the Heights Wellness Center at the high school, which is a beautiful clinic, three exam rooms, waiting room, a small lab, all of those things that you would see in your community pediatrician's office. And we see um, they are now open two to three days a week at the high school. And Metro also provides services, um, primary health care services to our other schools through um, taking their mobile units out to those um, sites. We have um, seven elementary schools, two middle schools, and then the high school. And we're just starting this week, actually, to transport students from one of our elementary schools up to the clinic at the high school so that we can be open another day there at one of our um, taking students from one of our schools that don't have a lot of usage. Um, one of the things I always like to share when I talk about our experience here is we are in a community that's within walking distance of three hospitals. Okay, so you would think that um, access to health care would not be an issue for our families, but it's an issue for our families, which is why school-based health was so important for us. Um, we also have a high Medicaid um, uh, percentage of students um, enrolled in Medicaid, but we also have families that have transportation, significant transportation issues and other issues that kept them from um, their children, especially those with chronic illnesses, being able to see their uh, provider on a regular basis. So Metro works with us on um, primary health care, obviously, but also behavioral health. We started dental just last week. Um, and as I said, we're starting hub and spoke. So we are really excited about our relationship with Metro and um, looking to address and oh, I'm sorry. And we also have a, a full time embedded community health worker from Metro that works on all of those social determinants of health. So it's a it's a pretty robust relationship. And we have a lot of investment from Metro to work with us in our school based health program. Thank you, Nancy. And we'll last but certainly not least, Javar, if you want to share what your your school based health center partnerships look like. Sure. Thanks for this opportunity again. As I mentioned, I'm Javar Jackson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Third Street Family Health Services. Um, we're located in Mansfield as our headquarters, but we have school-based health centers in um, Ram uh, Richland County as well as Crawford County. Uh, a little newer to the space, uh, we started in 2019 um, with a part-time health center inside of Mansfield City Schools um, and leveraged some grant funds to make it a full-time practice. 
uh, we use that service to support primary care dentistry and similar to the other uh, uh, host here, we, we do community health worker support um, as well as behavioral health. Similar to Nancy's shop, we provide a hub and spoke model where we have a brick and mortar that's open year round. Uh, so we are, we're open even when the school closes for summer to provide supports over the summer. Uh, and we provide telehealth supports throughout the school district. As of last year, we expanded from uh, through a merger of an organization in a different county. We expanded from two health center locations to um, 13 school based health center programs between three counties. Um, so still doing a lot of work to, to, to bridge the gaps and understanding between the three dynamics that are existing. Primarily in our other counties, we provide behavioral health support. Um, we also have uh, some supports where we contract out uh, speech therapy um, in our Crawford County community. Um, and then as far as telehealth is concerned, it's really been a safety net to support uh, students that may uh, leave school um, or have reasons to leave school. It's a way to mitigate any type of uh, truancy issues related to illness. So we, we're really, I say, a fortunate in this last year to see such a significant growth um, um, and, and a lot of unduplication. I want to say in the last year, um, we've we had just under 3000 encounters at one of our locations, which is about 120 percent increase from our initial um, start in 2019. Thanks, Shavar. And um, I, I, you know, I hope that you, you've you've heard that there are a variety of services that school-based health centers provide, and 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 um, each of our partners here operates uh, the school-based health centers kind of slightly differently. Maybe incorporating telehealth, some also incorporating mobile. Um, if, if maybe starting, Javar, if you can just speak a little bit more about how how are you working with your school partners and setting up and maintaining your your school-based health centers how, how did the school-based health center come about and then how how does that partnership work sure um, so i'm three years into the work here at third street um, originally from detroit michigan uh, where we had a few school-based health centers um, when I came in, we were <clears throat> right during the pandemic. Uh, so as always, we wanted to start doing the com with our community needs assessment. And prior to uh, the work we were completing at the school, uh, we were primarily focused on adult health because we have a pretty nice bit of pediatricians in the community. So it didn't seem significant um, to support. But when we saw uh, some of the health concerns in the community, it really did raise more attention to the access to care need, specifically within the school district. And so we approached the Mansfield City Schools um, leadership, including their board, and discussed some of the dynamics within the school. Um, at the same time, there were some grant funds available to support the growth and expansion of services. And so with that, with the, the seed money we had, we were able to um, support a full-time practitioner because, again, you know, looking at the school and having that conversation uh, at, at the grassroots, it was really being able to understand the, not just the dynamic of healthcare delivery, but how does that affect the overall student performance within the school? And we saw that from the Ohio Healthy um, Children's Platform that many of the kids never had wellness visits. They, they were had undiagnosed behavioral health challenges. Um, there, Mansfield is a, is a city that still does not have fluoridated water supply. Um, so there's still there were some dynamics that we were able to approach with keen understanding, but also marrying that to some of the school specific data. Um, as far as expanding and understanding telehealth, um, you know, kind of talking about where we would put brick and mortar, you know, full time staff does take money uh, and it does take a lot of work um, to really put them in place. And so we wanted to identify ways to uh, marry the two. How do we still uh, support the students, but also uh, make it a sustainable model uh, throughout the school program? And so similar to what Nancy suggested, um, we, we entertained the hub and spoke model um, and pitched it to the school board as a as a safety net, um, still giving the access to a brick and mortar physical touch um, from a provider, but also as a safety net to help triage um, students that are in elementary school and high school that may not necessarily have the ability um, to leave the campus to go and get received care. 
And it's been a great opportunity. We've actually seen an increase um, in the telehealth work that we've done um, so over the, the last three years, as well as from a ratio perspective, one in every seven students that we see use telehealth as their primary source of care prior to um, coming to Mal Malabar Care Connect uh, to receive that additional service or follow-up. Um, so definitely working through that relationship with the school district, by, get building buy-in, understanding the need and the heartbeat of the community, um, and also making sure that the data continues is, is continuously measured so that we see the impacts of the services that we provide. Thank you, Javar. And I'm wondering, um, Dr. Shamblin, if you can share what your partnerships look like and how you how you came to decide to set up school-based health centers in the locations that you have them um, and what that partnership with the school district looks like as well. Sure. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, sort of that developmental, organically grown um, and historical learning has sort of been our approach. Um, in rural Appalachia, the schools really are primarily the heart of the community and certainly things circle around that for children. So pretty early on, um, we had interest in supporting kids where they were and families where they were, and that those were certainly schools. Um, and we, mental health became easier as a startup only because there's less infrastructure involved in that and less need for, you know, startup funds. So many of our relationships started through that avenue and um, it helped us know where it was worth investing in terms of um, sort of building out a clinic and some of those sorts of things. We have um, learned also pretty early on in our work in our area anyway, that the school leadership driving the process is really important to us. So we've had schools approach us um, and um, we've sat with them and maybe they really didn't have, you know, like, like this school-based health center stuff is kind of cool. Maybe we'd need one for our school versus schools that um, really had been um, participating in, you know, like ODE's learning community or, or, or a nationwide children's learning community or something of that nature where they had done some pre-planning and had some information about their student population and what they were looking for in a health partner. And that, that's that been really key to the success we've had with our um, actual school-based health centers because they're a pretty big investment all the way around for schools, for the health partner and from a funding perspective. So having um, that educated and planful approach. And, and then honestly, when schools have approached us, I mean, I'm just really honest in saying, working with Hopewell means you're working with Hopewell, that we're gonna have to sit together and figure out how we're gonna fund this, that you know we don't have the kind of resources where we can come in and build you anything, but you know we can work together to identify resources, to think about what model will work best. And so it starts with those kind of conversations so that you're jointly creating together and then jointly figuring out how to fund it, that vision together. And so for our school-based health centers, They've all been built that way where the school figures out what they can afford to chip in and what we can afford to chip in. And we just creatively kind of figured that out. Thankfully, it's gotten easier. There's been some really nice investments in the last couple of years for the capital piece from both the health and um, the school partner facility aspects. Um, but we, we've just found that um, that has been pretty important. And most of our schools have a school health committee of some sort that we see as sort of a really important working group for us, it, even from the beginning and the get-go. Um, and that um, often we try to say, well, what are some things we can do right now? So maybe we can sponsor a vaccine clinic or something and be working our way toward um, a, a dynamic on-site school-based health clinic that we jointly run and, and decide together. And so after all of those learnings, sort of our best model is Nelsonville York, where that superintendent had a vision of an integrated care clinic. He had funds that he wanted to um, in, in, in place. He has created space where all of his specialty providers, his um, speech language therapist, his occupational therapist, his all of that team, as well as his school nurse, 
are inside the clinic space as well as our providers and they really work seamlessly. And so to me now that's like the ideal to shoot for. <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for sharing that and really appreciate the perspective that working with one school district is working with, with one school district um, and, and, and that the needs are going to be different and vary. Um, wondering if um, kind of shifting over a little bit and, and if, if our other panelists had thoughts to add, please, please feel free to jump in um, on, on how to work with your either your, your provider partner or your school partner. Um, but, but just um, wanted to hear from, from, Dina um, and Dr. Mansoor, how how was your school-based health center filling gaps in access to health care? Um, and what were the other gaps that you really saw the school-based health center filling? I can go, I can go first and then Dina, feel free, you know, feel free. But I think we actually had a very similar, you know, and our um, oldest school-based health center has been around for almost 25 years. So we've been doing this for a while, but at the time, um, two of our school-based health centers are in the neighborhood where the hospital is. And when we looked at data, over 50% of those kids hadn't had a well child check in the last three years. Not that they were necessarily historically getting their primary care from children's, but we were, we offer it, you know, offer it there. So um, it's really interesting sort of the access patterns, you know, for kids. So I think in general, when we launched, we were obviously feeling a pretty sort of significant, um, you know, significant need just for sort of basic, you know, you know, basic primary care. I think through kind of some of the processes that, you know, Sherry was kind of sharing about. I mean, I think the, the like the trusted partnership with the community, with the schools, with the parents and really, you know, sort of doing that more comprehensive needs assessment. And honestly, like on an ongoing basis, revisiting kind of with the partners, you know, what the needs are is just really, you know, critical. So we do a lot of the same things around, you know, sort of um, being part of local school decision-making committees. But I think it's also really important. The other kind of component that helps you kind of get to um, the gaps that you're closing is also kind of working with the other other partners in the school. So we're typically not the only partner I mentioned. There's often a co-located mental health partner. There may be a school nurse. There might be school district staff that are helping support the, you know, academic success or, um, you know, success of the children in the building. So just being really connected to those other individuals because they are often also the ones that are seeing um, some of the new frontline needs and the gaps that need to be filled. And then how do you, you know, collaboratively um, solve those together? We've certainly seen, I think, probably because of the pandemic, um, you know, significant um, increase in mental health needs. So trying to figure out additional ways um, to do that. We're beginning to talk about um, bringing a true integrated behavioral health model into our um, school-based health centers. So um, uh, not not necessarily specifically like kind of um, um, treatment oriented services, but getting upstream to universally address kind of issues in a more proactive way um, based on those gaps. And then I think probably the other thing that we see is, and I think why we've brought um, community health workers kind of into the more direct model is just seeing a significant increase in, you know, needs um, uh, around, around social determinants that are, you know, underlying and impacting care. So working with families and um, students um, in the school to figure out creative ways um, you know, to close gaps. And then we've had a really great opportunity to get some of the funding around the food pantry um, dollars, you know, as a very specific kind of more recent initiative um, for our, um, a couple of our school-based health centers um, in order to actually practically help, you know, help close those gaps. Yeah, so, um, you know, our, the school district that we're working with, they already kind of identified what some of their needs were and they kind of approached us saying, hey, these are our needs, how can you help? And I think a lot of that um, had to do with children, one, comprehensive well child does it's not being up to date, um, children accessing adult care facilities versus pediatric care facilities and frequently using urgent cares and emergency rooms for their very basic needs. And so ensuring that kids would get the appropriate level of care um, and access to that care, that was big. And another thing with our district, um, the community health department does not offer immunizations unless you are a patient of the federally qualified health care center in the area. So children who identified a primary care provider who may not have been a VFC provider of vaccines didn't receive their vaccines. So they would sign waivers and, and then continue to, you know, attend school um, without their vaccines being current. So that was something they were really hopeful for, that we would be able to bring vaccines in, um, which we were actually able to do this year. And we were able to 
increase the number of students who received their vaccines by the cutoff date by 83% this year. So that was that was huge for the district. Um, as I mentioned, we're still kind of in our infancy stage. So I think we continue to identify those gaps in care. And as you hear with some of these larger school-based health centers, all of these additional services in place, like community health workers, and of course the mental health component. Um, I, like everybody else on here, um, has seen the increase in, in mental health needs um, with our students. And so continuing to find ways to put those other supports in place to, can, to close those gaps um, is, is really important in the work that we're doing right now. Thank you, Dina. Um, Nancy, you mentioned earlier, um, which I think is, is just really important to lift up and highlight is that you're in a community where there are three hospitals and yet access to care is still, is still a concern and it's still an issue for your students. Um, can you can you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say that? Why is it a barrier? Why does it continue to be a barrier? Um, access and care, why is that a barrier for, for your community? And then um, if you can also share kind of what the receptivity has been to your school-based health center. Reed, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit what the what has been to the community. The, the receptivity. So receptivity. How, how, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so um, so for our students, uh, we, we have a, a very um, diverse population uh, socioeconomically, meaning I think it's our district is right now around 55% of our students are enrolled in, in Medicaid, but we also have many students who have, you know, very robust private insurance and, and, um, and have some wealth. So we're an interesting um, district that we have, we definitely have some families who don't have the barriers of transportation or of working two or three jobs or third shift where they can't get their, um, child to an appointment because they're, they're, um, you know, at, at a second or a third job, but we have a lot of families who are in, in that situation. We also have, it's, it's dimin diminishing over the last few years, but we have a, a significant population of Nepali refugee families who don't have transportation at all and obviously have that um, language barrier. And um, being uh, in close proximity to CASE and some of the student population and, and um, folks who are here, we, we also have a large population of folks um, who don't speak English as a first language at attending our schools and, and their parents um, don't. And so, you know, we definitely had those barriers and saw that a number of our students were not getting well child visits. We had a horrible problem before um, our partnership with Metro Health with the immunizations and especially those that required us excluding our students from attendance. Um, and so that was a huge piece of our initial push with our families and the Metro Health team worked with our school nurses to identify those students who were on that list. And they had a, a unified strategy for outreach to those families to say that they can get the immunizations right in the building and families don't have to take off work and leave to be able to, to um, get an immunization so they could stay in school. Um, so I would say that the, I, it, it's hard to believe we're, we're six years into this relationship and we've just passed 30%, the 30% mark for enrollment for our district. And so we need to get up to 70% to really make it, or at least to 50% to make it work for, for um, Metro Health. Um, really, um, I, I know that some of my Metro Health and former and current colleagues are in this meeting and they're probably smiling because that's a real challenge the district communication around what it means, what school-based health could mean for your family. For some families, it's just convenience. For some families, it's real access. For some families, it's management of chronic disease. And new messaging that we've been working on, and especially through individual conversations with some families through our social work team, is this whole um, social determinants of health um, work that the community health worker from Metro um, who's assigned to our district is is just fabulous at. And, and people don't think of that. When they think of school-based health, they think of immunizations and sports physicals and 
doctor's visits, but but our community health worker helps families get two or three months of rent paid when they're at risk of being homeless. Um, we have a, a high population of homeless students, or they help get um, uh, their utilities paid or help them access um, food. And so those are things that we, we've we really found as a district, and it's been a challenge, um, that we have to get our messaging to very different um, families within our district. I don't know if that answered your question, Reem, but it's, it's you know, I'm, I, I lay it out there because that's that's been difficult. We did start with a, a um, community needs assessment. In fact, it was part of, before we even decided to go forward with school-based health, we worked with United Way and had a broad community, um, uh, community needs assessment and work with folks from many different, um, from behavioral health and, and physical health and transportation. And, um, and that's why we decided to move forward with um, school-based health. And then Metro worked with us on the actual development of the needs assessment around community, uh, around um, school-based health. Thanks, Nancy. And I think um, you bring up you bring up a really important point, which is the, the working with the families component to school based health centers. So we talk about the there's a partnership between the healthcare provider and the school, but really it's the family and the students that are at the center of that. And one of the the I think most common questions, particularly for those that are not as familiar with the school based health center model, are how do school based health centers engage the families? So how do they communicate back to the families about the needs of the student or what what the students are experiencing, what they're seeing? Um, and so just wanted to, to open it up if if maybe a few of you can share how do, what does that communication look like? Um, one of the things that this is Jabbar, one of the things that uh, we we found out early on with our school based health center model is um, when we provided care, there was a disconnect um, the, the, the the student needed something and the parent was unaware. Um, of that need, or it was so far gone uh, that it, there was a lot of catch up that needed to occur. So we needed to figure out a way of bringing that parent bedside um, so that they're aware, not just of what's happening with the student, but also um, they can provide informed consent um, of the type of services that are needed for the student. And so one of the things that we were able to do from not just a telehealth perspective, um, but even when the student is inside of the, the exam room, um, is that we have a phone directly on the computer of our provider and they can call the parent right then and there and get them engaged um, with the student. They'll, they'll let them know, hey, this is what's happening with the kid. Um, these are the challenges. This is the type. This is a treatment plan. What are your thoughts about it? Um, in some cases, we have seen it where the parent has um, thoroughly enjoyed that because in the you know standard pediatrician practice, sometimes they don't even go in the exam room. They're waiting in the lobby, but they're able to physically be a part of that. But on the flip side of it, um, we also provide autonomy for the student. If there are things that they want to re you know remain silent. Um, within the room, um, we, we honor that. We allow them to have that one-on-one -on -one with their provider. So it's really playing that balancing act um, of, of giving the, the parent that the needed information, but also protecting um, the student's wishes um, while they're uh, receiving care behind closed doors. Another thing that we've tried to do or uh, to, to kind of make it full circle is increase transparency within the school and, and the school leadership. And while we don't give diagnosis information to the, to the um, leadership and teachers, we do share these are the trends we're seeing. Um, within the school. Hey, you know, you have a higher instance of behavioral health challenges here. Um, and we've seen more uptick in ADHD diagnoses. Um, so let's, how does that then affect curriculum um, within the pro, within the school district? And so that then may also lend a hand or lens um, to engaging the parent, a part of the parent engagement committee that we have so that they can also, you know, as Sherry talked about that continuum, uh, bringing that same level of, of knowledge base as well as school uh, toolkits uh, to the household so that that student does not get bum rushed with all this information while they're at the school, while they're in the healthcare provider's office, and then at home there's, an, there's nothing happening. There's no continuum of care. And so we try to leverage our community health workers as home visiting professionals to kind of help close that gap as well while the student is at home and sharing some more, um, as, as we like to call it, um, physical uh, 
ch challenges and changes that we could do right in the home. For example, you know, if a parent, you know, I think this is a pretty irrelevant example. We had a student that was diagnosed with ADHD um, and was in tutoring, was not necessarily receiving um, the best of care, best of grades. And we sent the community health worker home and learned that the parent was just yelling at the kid because uh, they didn't know, understand how to um, educate or share, you know, this new math that the kids are going through, right? You know, we went through, at, you know, three plus three is six. This three plus three is six for them in a different type of way. And so our community health worker was was well aware of some of the dynamics within the, the uh, home and educated right right there and provided that student and, and parent some resources. And that did change that student's outcome. We went from having a, a, a student that's about a 1.0 GPA to 2.7 over, over two semesters. And so we kind of can see how that type of a dynamic really supports um, baseline education beyond healthcare, but also from the actual academic performance for that, for that student. Thank you, Jafar. Just want to want to open it up to our our other panelists, Dr. Shamblin, and um, I think if you're if you're also able to share or elevate a story of impact from your school based health center, that would be terrific. So, um, in, in addition to all the things Javar laid out, which were multiple, I mean, like I think those are strategies a lot of us employ. One of the things I thought might um, the the other aspect of it is really trying to um, make the health center staff just part of the school community and participating in, in, in things that the school does in the community. So like um, in our community before school, you have sort of the back to school bashes and some of those sorts of things. Our staff are there and really just weaving in and out and trying to connect with families. Um, we at home football games. I mean, that's not a place to sign a parent up, but it's a place to sort of be um, a face and a name and, and build relationships. And so in addition to all the fine strategies that you've laid out, Jabbar, I think, you know, that would be one piece. And then um, Dr. Monsoor, you talked about sort of the also working at a universal level. And so I see that as being an important consideration too. How do you really think about having impact with all students? And so um, I'm trying to think about, I, I, I honestly am not sure I can um, move your, but you, you know, you had such a wonderful example, Javar, of a very specific student. I think about the um, students that uh, we're able to just even keep in school. So in our area, um, again, Southeastern Ohio, transportation is really a challenge. It really is not uncommon if a student is sick or has to go to a mental health appointment or a, you know, a medical appointment for asthma, um, that that student misses the whole entire day. And because of the aspects of transportation and the family may not be able to know that somebody could get all of the other kids and the family on the bus or off the bus, it really may mean all the siblings missed the whole day of school. And so if I'm thinking at a systems level of success, that's one thing we've been able to do is really reduce those really unnecessary absences. I mean, it's really silly that brothers and sisters would need to miss school simply because, you know, they have a sibling that needs to go get, um, a, again, a preventive medical appointment that's pre-planned and set up. Um, so that's probably been our greatest success is really being able to keep all the other kids in the family at school and that many of those mental health services and primary acute care visits that really require half an hour or an hour of time, the, the, the student is only missing that amount of time and not a whole day. And um, we actually have a pretty good return rate of students when they visit our health center um, being able to return to class and, you know, depending on the months, because there are times when, when they have a communicable disease, you really want the child to go home. But, you know, there are a lot of seasons where we have as high as 50 to 60% of students who were seen that day get to go back to class and stay at school and missed 15 minutes. So that's probably our biggest systemic level success. 
Yeah, Reeve, I could add just, you know, we did, you know, like looking at more like that population level, you know, sort of impact. We um, you know, know that asthma is probably one of the number one reasons in chronic health conditions. It's one of the number one reasons, you know, kids are absent um, from school. So we actually worked together um, in partnership with our school nurses first to recognize that we were probably way under identifying who in the school actually had asthma. There's a pretty big gap, like maybe, they, you know, when we started, you know, 10% of the population was known to have asthma. We knew that the prevalence in the population was probably closer to one in four and were able to identify, you know, sort of additional kids. And then once we figured out who had asthma, the nurses actually did a really nice assessment of all of those students, um, not a billable service, just sort of assessing asthma control. And then from there, children who didn't have control, you know, offering families the opportunity to have a preventative visit around their asthma with the school-based health center, or just if the family had already established care with someone outside, you're reminding them that, hey, like, you know, if you don't want to see us, like, go see your, you know, primary uh, care provider. And then we were able to really optimize their, you know, medication management, environmental triggers, the sort of whole kind of asthma management program. And this was actually in published work. We were able to reduce, you know, both ED utilization and hospitalizations for kids. We didn't directly measure absences, but to like Sherry's point, if you are you know, in the hospital or in the emergency room or symptomatic, you're not obviously in an optimal optimal condition to learn, or you are losing instructional time. And so, um, probably downstream does sort of impact, you know, sort of those kids' ability um, to be in, you know, to be in school. And so, it's a really nice, you know, kind of population level way that school based health centers can be part of like solutions that really impact um, both health, health and educational outcomes. I I think one thing that that I would share about the impact, I think I think it might have been Nancy that mentioned, you know, when you think about school based health, people think about um, vaccines and you know rashes, pink eye, those types of things. And one of the things that that I have found doing this work is, you know, some of these kids have very complex physical health and psychosocial needs, and I've been doing this for many years and I, my dream was always to be able to take healthcare out to where children are. And, and now I'm given that opportunity. But I think when you finally have that time to really kind of dig and you realize these needs are very, they're just layers deep and we get that time to start kind of working through them. Um, again, that the kid is right there in the building. So you can work a little bit at a time on pieces of it. But, you know, kids, I, in my first couple of weeks last year in starting the school-based health center, um, I saw a child who had a genetic condition, which um, caused her to have some immune deficiency. Well, she had been placed in kinship care and some of that information did not get, can, didn't continue with her. And so um, she saw a specialist at the age of about 23 months old and was told to come back in six months. And now I'm seeing her at the age of 12. She had had no follow-up, had been dealing with, you know, multiple infections back to back, missing a lot of school. And so through digging through a medical record and being able to identify that this child had all of these medical needs, which had not been met, I was able to connect the child back to our subspecialist at the hospital and, you know, improve her health overall. But that's, you know, one of many, many cases like that. And I think um, the school be is very thankful that you start to uncover some of these things and some of the um, somatic complaints. So that the kids who are, you know, frequent flyers of the school clinic with stomach aches and headaches. And when um, I have an opportunity to see them in the school-based health center, we can really kind of get to the bottom of that. And sometimes we're uncovering some significant mental health issues that once we address those, then we can stop those you know, frequent visits to the school nurse. Um, and I think that's been a big impact in our, our district. Nina, <clears throat> Nancy, I saw you go on un unmute and then, yeah, and then so just, feel free to feel free. To yeah, mine is much more anecdotal, but it's something that a conversation I had with the mom on Saturday, we had a Black History Month, fabulous celebration and gathering at the high school on Saturday. And I was trying to get people to go down and tour the, the Heights Wellness Center because the Metro Health staff to somebody's earlier point was at the event and, and giving tours. And I went up to a mom and said, have you seen the, the wellness center? And she said, no, but they you know, really helped me with my daughter. She was sick at school one day, she went down there, they literally did a blood test and she had severe anemia and prescribed medications that Metro has an arrangement. They were delivered to their house that afternoon and she's been so much better. She was struggling and she plays sports. She was struggling. She had severe anemia and 
because it was right there in the building and she was able to get uh, the blood test um, and the prescription that day, the mom was super thankful and went down and said so to the staff. But uh, again, that's anecdotal, but it just happened 48 hours ago. Thank you for sharing, Nancy. And I think, um, you know, ho hopefully our um, our audience here has heard just the the scope of impacts that school based health centers can have. So we talked about health care and health health outcomes. We talked about education outcomes, and then also the social determinants and drivers of health, particularly when you have community health workers going out to the home and providing some kind of one on one parent parent education and family education as well. Um, I do just want, if we can maybe quickly, uh, before we opened up for, for questions, um, if, if you can share, uh, you know, this is a very, very impactful model. How can this model be supported at the state level? What makes it maybe unique that it, it might need some additional supports at the state level? And what would that look like? Well, I, I can go. I mean, I think... One of the things for myself is just kind of that um, increased funding and long-term funding um, to increase the services that we're able to provide. Um, in addition, I think we've all, you probably heard many of us mention the, um, the importance of the school nurse. And I think a lot of times that is where we identify these kids. And unfortunately, not every school building has a nurse. And I think, um, you know, increasing the number of school nurses um, would really help identify those kids earlier and get them to our school-based health centers where we can provide more expansive services. You know, as I mentioned, uh, we, we've we grown pretty significantly over um, the course of seven months. Um, the dynamics of that includes, you know, the demand continues to grow around behavioral health, um, as well as some of those those primary care services. Unfortunately, being in my art neck of the woods, staffing continues to be a challenge um, globally, um, but more so in the school based health center model because it's such a niche environment. And so, some level of resource and resource development and initiatives to increase that level of workforce within the school based health center. Um, will definitely help us to remain that safety net. And, and I'll have to go on record by saying as an FQHC, we've tried the model of, hey, well, you know, if this doesn't work, we can send the students to our FQHC brick and mortar. But the the, the value of having the the, the, the students within the school-based health center um, and actually remaining within care there um, far out seeks the ability for us to send those students elsewhere, as well as the buy-in of those students receiving those services within the building itself. It can It's a continuity thing at this point. It's not so much just uh, getting the students to care, it's ability to, to marry care with he healthy educational outcomes. And that workforce, to, to Dr. Shamlin's point, um, is very valuable in that as we take on the imagery um, of the school and become a, a choice partner there. Yeah, I, I um, would echo uh, the any investments made in workforce are, um, are help a number of um, constituents, but also school-based health centers. Um, funding for startup is honestly pretty important because most of the time that just doesn't exist in any system. But Jabbar and I both represent federally qualified health centers, which, you know, if you look at any of the literature, our organizations are often identified as ideal health partners because of the kind of reimbursement that FQHCs get. And I'm here to say that even when you get very high percentages of consents, Nancy, and even when you have a health partner that has really good reimbursement rates and reimburse, you know, bills what is possible to bill, if that alone is used to sustain school-based health centers, I'm a bit afraid we won't really realize the full potential of what they can be for our schools. I think there's a certain percentage um, that need of operational costs that need, it. I don't care if it goes to the school partner or the health partner, I really don't care, but you've got to have some way that buys the time of those folks on site to really become part of the school community and operate at a universal level. I mean, and that that's, so that's something the health partner can't 
mill floor. And then the access has really been pretty important to our superintendent. So the fact that if they've got a school nurse seeing a kid and that kid can be seen right away, having some of you know that time available also precludes kind of appointments that are back to back to back to back to back to back. And so um, I don't like we we've been at this since 2013 and and we're a nonprofit with a break even. We're not trying to make any money, trying to break even. And we subsidize all of our school-based health centers with some of our more general funds. So I just see that as being very critical. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you to our, our wonderful panelists. Um, I do want to turn it over, Kelly, if we just have a, a few minutes for questions, if there are any questions, making sure we get to those. Yeah, thank you so much, panel. Um, for your time today. And I, I, I always love a school-based healthcare discussion. It's, it always makes me feel so hopeful about what, you know, what could be and what we can provide our students. And I, I could take this to two hours and I probably would still want more. So I, I really appreciate your time. If there are any lawmakers, legislative aides, um, or agencies on the phone who have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. Um, and then we will move on to the general audience. Um, I will say from a technical perspective, any attendees will not be able to unmute. So you either need to put your questions in the Q&A or in the chat. So if you have questions, please do that now. We'll give everybody two minutes to enter questions and address those. So until we have a question, here's something we can think about. We do have legis some legislators and legislative offices on here. What what what's the what one message would you like to leave them with? What would you like them to know about your school-based health center and what would be helpful for for your continued success? I'll just say one phrase. School-based health is um the, it's the whole child framework in action. So Ohio's whole child framework needs school-based health in order to um, succeed. And I'll just echo what Sherry and Javar and others are saying, but we just need stable, consistent funding. So I think it's not only a challenge for federally qualified health centers, it's a challenge for hospital systems that are um, also, you know, involved, uh, you know, with providing support. We're not, we're not, we're not breaking even. Okay, I, I don't see we... any questions from lawmakers or legislative aides in the chat. Does anyone else from the general population have questions for us? Go ahead and type those in now. Mr. Jackson, you mentioned about the, I think you called it a parent engagement committee, or I think that's... Can you talk a little bit about that? I thought that was very interesting, and I think that's something that I think a lot of people are interested in how parent how you how parents are engaged in the process. Sure. Uh, so for our parent engagement committee, um, it, it really starts with the enrollment process. So when the student gets enrolled into uh, school, we provide an a, uh, informed consent form at the same time, and once that page once that student is signed up as a patient. Um, we then send out a correspondence to, to parents about being actively involved um, with the school-based health center, but also as a way of getting the, the parents involved with the school um, programming that is available. So the committee includes um, just a, a handful of parents that have elected to be a participant. We tried to be a little more intentional in the type of parents that we reached out to. Um, our focus was more so for our at-risk youth. Um, so those that are, you know, at, at potential for truancy or some other type of school based uh, needs for intervention. Um, so we really targeted those parents um, to get their feedback on the needs within um, their student base, as well as um, what will be some uh, methods to kind of help with uh, strengthening their students performance. 
Um, it also includes uh, a group called our um, PBIS group, which is our behavioral intervention group within the school, um, as well as a community health worker and a school um, a staff member. And we meet quarterly um, just to, to, to discuss, but we also actively invite the parents to come to the school-based health center um, to, to kind of not just hang around, but to, to provide some helpful feedback. We've also converted a lot of those parents to become um, cl clinic patients. So they now receive their care from our school-based health center provider as well. Thank you so much. That was, that was great. Um, I don't see any questions, any other questions. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us today. As I mentioned before, all content, recordings, and links that are shared in the chat and other resources will be shared um, with everyone who signed up for the webinar by an email after this presentation. Um, and if you have any other questions or want more information about upcoming Ohio Legislative Children's Caucus webinars and meetings, please contact me. Um, at kvisrael at childrensdefense.org. And we look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thank you.